Okay, we are picking up from where we just left off. You may have been live with this on Fakeologist. We were doing a joint live stream. It is still August 22nd, 2024. And we were talking about uh, what we're doing. Calling out the fake, separating the fake from the real. And also um, taking calls. There were some technical issues. We didn't have all the chatters in one room, but we got a lot of new callers. So now you are all, um, a lot of you here are now members of the main channel, but those of you who aren't, uh, if you get on the newsletter, ips.monster, you will all be on the same sheet with myself and with Fakeologist as we grow this network, the parallel media. Uh, one of the things I brought up was the monkey god in the meta script. So one of our contentions is that there are no coincidences on the world stage. And this is a far cry from saying everything's faked. That's not what we're saying. Uh, good liars don't lie with every breath. They lie strategically when they have your trust by not lying most of the time. And the media is, a, is the world's best liar. And what we're examining here are these seeming coincidences, but which have a deeper meaning. Like, for example... Uh, predictive programming in general. We're talking about presenting you with concepts, ideas in advance of some news event which taps into all of your preconceptions and post-hypnotic suggestions they've packed into your brain. And right now there happens to be a development in the meme verse. So for some reason the monkey god is front and center. And so to bring up all the different examples here, um, let's bring this up first and then we'll go from there, but I'm just suggesting that uh, the fact they're bringing up this meme on so many different facets has to mean something. This is not a mere coincidence and we're not cherry picking because we're not just picking from everyday events and then finding things that match up. No, these all qualify as extraordinary events. It is extraordinary and beyond um, just the expected that you would have a 90 foot tall statue of the monkey god Hanuman erected in Houston 90 foot tall statue third largest in the United States it's 88.6 feet high that's how tall it is 88.6 feet tall the third tallest statue in the United States is Lord Hanuman now this is the monkey god called the statue of Union so this is a pretty big deal. You have a 90 foot tall statue of a monkey showing up by itself. But this happens a couple of days, it's unveiled a couple of days after the WHO declares monkeypox an emergency. So this is also significant. This is the second time we've had a major public health emergency announced by the WHO with this level of alert, the highest level of alert. So the WHO on Wednesday 8:14 declared the monkeypox a big deal. Let me go ahead and play this clip. Old friend, our friend uh, uh, Tedro here. Mpox declared global health emergency by the WHO. It says, as the suspected confirmed cases rise in Africa, exceeding 15,000 for the year. So here's a short clip where it's being announced advised me that, in its view, the situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. It's clear that a coordinated international response is essential to stop these outbreaks and save lives. A public health emergency of international concern is the highest level of alarm. Okay, so high alert. Now, on that same day, we're talking 8-14-2024, on the same day, a new movie was released bad monkey on apple tv so the theme bad monkey is also key here because we're talking about uh, the rage virus as you'll see bad monkey makes its debut on apple tv on august 14th so they just dropped this one vince vaughn now i haven't seen it yet the cover art has vince vaughn with a monkey on his shoulder and behind him the sun is setting it's a beach i haven't watched it but the timing of bad monkey with monkey pox is therefore notable in 
this broader context where we have a 90 foot tall statue of this monkey god erected. But then it gets even more significant and, and less likely to be a mere coincidence because now you have Black Myth Wukong released, a 2024 action role playing game. And in this game, you play the monkey god. And significantly, the video game broke some records for the most number of concurrent players at one time. So how do you explain that? A million people are plugged into a game where they are avatars of the monkey god as a 90 foot tall statue is erected, the movie comes out, the pandemic is declared, or this emergency is declared, but the reoccurring theme here is this monkey god. Then you have Return to the Planet of the Apes, recent release, 2024. We had already talked about Planet of the Apes because it was featured or referenced in the Paris Olympics opening. And then Obama is out on the world stage speaking at the DNC. So we see President Obama out there again. And he had famously talked about how he has a, st a little idol of the monkey god in his pocket and always carries it with him. So we're looking at this Hanuman character and this reoccurring theme. And there are several other examples as well. Uh, another movie which was released on significantly on 311. So think about the date 311, the significance there, uh, March 11th, major pandemic day. On that day, a movie Monkey Man was released. And this was produced by Jordan Peele. Uh, Jordan Peele did Nope. And Nope opens up with a ragey chimp murdering some people. Now this movie, Monkey Man, has to do with some boxer who wears an ape mask. And he has enough of being beaten down by more popular fighters and he gets ragey. So the theme here is a rage-filled monkey. A rage ape. Now we can add to this that 28 days later is... Right now, we're talking about the movie 28 Days Later, it's directed by the guy who directed Civil War. So we've already talked about 28 Days Later in this context. Civil War is a movie about right-wing militias at war with the federal government. You have the rage virus is contained in here. And by the way, 28 Days Later, same director, is about apes and the rage virus that comes from the apes. So this reiterates, rage, apes. But same director... And they're making 28 years later, right now, to come out next year. So this theme has been brought up again. The rage virus that causes people to become violent. And it's a virus because their rage is contagious. Well, the only way a rage virus could spread is through media. And this was emphasized in the movie Civil War, where the right-wing militia types were very much anti-media. They killed some guy because they thought he was with Reuters or something. But the media-born virus, as in alt-media, as in X, as in disease X, a rage virus stemming from X. So the disease X has been a placeholder concept by the WHO for the big one that's to come that's going to be the thing that shuts us all down worse than 2020. And my contention has been for some time that disease X is a reference to a future mind virus that will be blamed for domestic terror, and it will emanate from the right-wing media e um, ecosystem. And so here we have multiple examples of the rage or the monkey virus, the monkey god, all brought up at the same time. And the director of Civil War and 20 Days Later is tied into this narrative. So this is what I'm looking at now. There are other examples that people have brought up of this character, this monkey god being brought up. So my question I ask here, Monkey God in the Metascript, concerted message or coincidence? My contention here is that this is a concerted message, but what does it mean? All right, we're joined by Penguin Doctor, Roxy, Anulfo Esteban. Yeah, we just got off the live stream with a Fakeologist and took a number of calls. I'll open up phones here if anybody wants to call in, and I want to consolidate all of the monkey pox and ape themes that we can and just putting it out there that this is not cherry picking this isn't texas sharpshooter fallacy and we can make this case because of the timing 
the specific timing, the declaration of this emergency coinciding with these movies, just as we saw with Trump and his ear wound, the Captain America trailer, Assassination Run, the episode in The Boys, and numerous other examples. This is an unveiling. And then the 90-foot-tall statue, and it's impossible to overestimate the significance here of Black Myth having a million people concurrently plugged in playing this character as the statue is erected. Uh, Black Myth Wukong just smashed the Steam single player game record. I'll go ahead and play a couple clips here just to give you an example of what we're looking at. Doubled the peak player count of Elden Ring on Steam. Hell, the Steam reviews are well north of 100,000, probably like over 140, 150k right now. They're hovering around 96%. I mean, this was literally the most played single player game on Steam ever before most of the Western world even woke up. And that's all. So, the most played game on Steam. So, it's already significant here. This is out of the ordinary, along with the giant statue. There's no coincidence here. This has been force memed out there, but in a very deep way, as people are literally playing the video game where they're embodying this character. They are the avatar of the monkey god for the duration of this game. So I am inclined to think that the monkey pox is highly significant. Not that I think we're going to be locked down because of it, but the very concept of the rage virus is contained within it. Valley. That's because of talent density. So for a while, we saw the Tencent and NetEase spread their uh, investments across the world. Anyway, I'm not too much into the video game world, but it's another area where predictive programming is very prominent, and we've noted the significance. For example, Modern Warfare 3 comes out on 10.6, and then on 10.7, you have the event in the Middle East where you have millions of people immersed in a simulation that is then reflected in what happens in the, quote, real world. So what does it mean that we are being immersed in simulations? The monkey, man movie, the video game, bad monkey, planet of the apes, the black myth. What are they, the programmers that is, the metascriptors, what are they going to do with this? What is the point to connecting us to this monkey god archetype? And again, based on my assessment of this, because we've talked about this rage virus before, is I think it does, in fact, tie into this rage virus. In fact, someone pointed out last night there's a movie, Project X, with uh, Ferris Bueller, uh, Matthew Broderick, and it's a 1987 film where monkeys are being experimented on. So here you have the X and the secret project and this connection again to apes or monkeys. And again, disease X, I believe, is rage virus. And the strongest connection to that theme is, of course, the movie Civil War, in which Kamala Harris kills Trump. If you read the subtext, that is what happens. Joined by Lesko, David Hazel. Symbia says, new 2024 documentary, Chimp Crazy. I love these chimps more than my kids inside the wild world of monkey moms. Okay. Video, woman at center after chimp crazy documentary speaks out. New HBO documentary shines light on chimps as captive pets. Okay, and it's got a pink background, which may have some significance. Babylon and the beast type stuff, perhaps. Interesting uh, symbolism here in the colors. So chimp crazy. And then there was something else. There was some rapper that someone had mentioned in the chat recently. Let me see if I can pull him up. And he has that name. Um, the name of the monkey god is built into this rapper who's in the news. I'll, I'll see if I can find that here in a moment. Okay, Conspire Act says, The movie Monkey Man came out back in April. Basically, the Indian John Wick about working class rising up against the elites and exacting revenge. Hanneman is referenced throughout. Now, it's not insignificant that Barack Obama has a Hanneman idol in his back pocket. So if you connect all these things, the rage virus, Planet of the Apes, and the idea of captive apes, 
the monkey virus being released, bad monkey, rage monkey, and one of the reoccurring themes is the ape being held captive. Uh, this is somehow some kind of subtext reference to class warfare, I would say. Penguin Doctor says, random monkey was running around the streets of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Do you remember those monkeys were, and I'll, I'll pull this up, there was some kind of incident and I'll, I'll see if I can find an in, um, information about that monkey that's loose. There was some incident about lab monkeys, and there's some kind of truck accident in Pennsylvania. Here we go. A truck carrying 100 lab monkeys collided with a dump truck in Pennsylvania. This was in January of 2022. And I know that after this, this is in Pennsylvania again, after this, then you had the first talk of the mpox outbreak and i don't know if it's on the anniversary but we had already noted these escaped lab monkeys so this is a theme that's been building up for some time and we should take this seriously as seriously as we take bats and bat soup and the symbol of the bat and how that has also been a huge component in the body of predictive programming for the covid thing so this is not insignificant and again, um, there's something else. The movie Monkey Man was produced by Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele did Nope. And Nope opens up with a chimpanzee that gets violent and kills people. So again, reoccurring theme. Ragey apes. Ragey monkeys. Escaping captivity. Uh, subject to experiments. Skyfish says there's a song by Toots and the Maytals called Monkey Man. The specials covered it. Okay, well, I, I'm suggesting here then that this is part of a bigger narrative about what's to come next, and I'm suggesting here that it ties into right-wing violence, specifically. And the, the reason I'm connecting this is that they're the ones who are catching disease X, the mind virus that is responsible for uh, violence. And who has promoted the idea of the existence of the mind virus, which is fake. Let me just bring this up. The mind virus concept isn't a real thing. I mean, it's a real thing. The mind virus isn't a real thing. It's just a bad analogy. You don't catch ideas, but that's what they want the public to think, so the public acquiesces to protections put in to prevent them from catching ideas they don't want to believe in. Like, I don't want to be a flat earther, so I can't look at that video. That's not how it works you have some kind of ability to arbitrate to decide whether or not something is believable to you or not. You don't automatically accept things. When I say people have mind aids, it's just because of a bad habit of not employing critical thinking when they're facing the black monolith. But outside of the hypnosis of their nightly programming for the most part, people do employ critical thinking. This is just our collective blind spot, and it's by design all by design. But they want the public to think that if you go on Twitter, you'll catch disease X, you'll buy an AR-15, and then you'll go do some domestic terrorism. That's what they want you to think. Okay, Chimp Crazy. Fascinating um, lead there, and I, I think we're on to something. This is way too much. Way too many examples. It's overlapping. And to have millions of minds embodying this monkey god at the same time. I may watch Bad Monkey tonight just to see if I've missed anything. So let me go through my notes, minds.com slash infinite plane society. By the way, if you missed the live stream with Fakeologist, I'll post a link after. Commenter asks, hey, Plane, do you have any docs or pics or vids that show or explain that Ashley Babbitt is alive? I've had no luck. Yeah, Woo's News. Look up Woo's News. And rejoice. Because Ashley Babbitt's not dead. And her mom's a crisis actor. I mean, a liar. These are terrible people. James True tweeted this earlier. If Alec Baldwin's crew didn't stage their shooting for film publicity they should have. If Trump didn't stage his shooting for free publicity, he should have. 
Lance Armstrong was the one who cheated. We caught him, which made everything else we do honest for a few years. Now, I agree with him. But I think that it's actually the case that Alec Baldwin's shooting was staged. That he didn't really shoot anybody. That Donald Trump wasn't shot at. Like, it's absolutely true. These were PR stunts. Every psychological operation is a PR stunt. It's just contextualized in a certain way. But these are hoaxes. These are PR stunts. What's interesting here, and I talked about this the other day, is that Alec Baldwin is a Trump twin as far as the roles he plays, like SNL. And his Trump derangement is just a cover, and it creates this association. But what's interesting here is that Trump once said that he could go out on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and not lose any votes. Alec Baldwin, again a Trump twin in the sense, shoots somebody and he gets his charges dropped. The trial gets dismissed. And this was on the day that Trump was shot. Then two days later, after Trump was fake shot, Trump has his 34 uh, uh, indictments. Everything is just dismissed. So I'm like, wait a minute here. Trump and Baldwin go free. Trump said he could shoot somebody and go free. Baldwin shot somebody and went free. There's kind of a mirroring here. And I think this mirroring is key. That's why I think it might be highly significant that... Robert De Niro, on his birthday, jumps off the yacht. And this is shortly after he talks about how much he likes Leonardo DiCaprio, face of the Titanic. And a few days after Trump was lambasted for playing the Titanic theme song, My Heart Will Go On, at one of his rallies. Because these characters, again, are... And I'm talking about the movies. In the movies, you have these actors who play these roles, but these actors are still in character. They play a different character on the world stage. They're still a propaganda conduit. These are not organic events. Till says Baldwin played De Niro on SNL too. Well, I did a full mind map on this and there's still more to it. But the predictive programming that Robert De Niro brings to the world stage uh, with regard to Trump is very significant because the roles he's played, let's just go with the sheriff in Machete, it's designed to build sympathy for the person who shoots him. So it makes sense that he's Trump deranged on the world stage. He's mad at Trump. He's trying to build up hate against Trump, where in one of his roles, he's the assassin. In another role, he's Trump deserving of being assassinated. In a couple of roles, the Joker one and Machete. And again, we have uh, determined, we've really discerned what we're actually looking at here. And it is, in fact, predictive programming. There's nothing accidental, nothing coincidental. It is 100% contrived. And it gets very obvious, and we can make that case very confidently, when you look at how intricately connected these events are all connected. The Reagan assassination to the Trump attempted assassination. I mean, Reagan attempted assassination. Trump attempted assassination. And you go into the weeds, the deeper you look, the more you find that it is fully integrated. The birthday of the shooter, the reason he did it, the movie that inspired him, the movie that inspired him, of course, inspires Joker. It just gets so layered that, yeah, we're looking at a multi-generational story that the Trump shooting was fake, just as fake as the Reagan shooting was. And then you look at James Brady and the agenda that was attached to the shooting, the mentally ill shooter and all this stuff, but James Brady then, being declared dead 33 years later, ruled a homicide, headshot, dies on 8-4. And the 8-4 connection has quite a lot to do with this headshot theme. And we mentioned two different shows, The Boys Assassination Run and Stranger Things season finale, season 4, episode 8, on both of these, the 4-8, and in each of these, the Trump character gets or is involved with this assassination attempt or he gets shot in the other one. And it's just like you can predict the predictive programming once you know what you're looking at. And Robert De Niro and his Trump derangement is purely performative. The Incompletist said the David Lynch short film what did Jack do from 2017 is fascinating. I'll take a look. 
Okay, this is in a lockdown train station. This is a short film by David Lynch. A homicide detective conducts an interview with a tormented monkey in a lockdown train. The monkey is, in, is suspected of murder. Kind of like Edgar Allan Poe-ish here. And someone else had brought up 12 monkeys. And so let me bring this up. Uh, 12 monkeys, again, the cover art does have the single eye emphasized. And this is strange. I, I brought this up yesterday, but in case you missed it, I picked up Selman Rushdie's new book at the library. And in the intro, he's talking about how the night before he was stabbed, and again, this was 33 years after the fatwa was declared, it was a $3.3 million bounty on his head. So we were already looking at this thing through the lens of it being a hoax. But in the intro to the book, he describes how he's out looking at the moon. And he remembers a trip to the moon, and he has this image of his head in his head of the moon with a bullet in its eye. So he's thinking about this old French film. And we had recently talked about this because the Paris Olympics had this image in its intro. The moon with the bullet. But the night before Selman Rushdie was stabbed in his right eye, and now he has an eye patch, he said, I had no idea as I remembered the image of the spaceship wounding the moon's right eye of what the next morning had in store for my own right eye. So he's describing an eerie coincidence that he just happened to be thinking about this before he was shot, I mean stabbed. But this has some significance if you consider uh, the Selman Rushdie event as predictive programming for the Trump eye wound thing, the, the headshot, which we've been waiting for. And it seems the ear piercing is just a lead up to that. Conspire Act says, it's like they're plucking different strings across the collective consciousness that we're immersed in to create a symphony of synchronicities that has a subconscious effect on group perception. Well, they have to reach everybody. So the giant monkey statue reaches a lot of people, sure. The video game reaches another demographic. People watching Vince Vaughn movie, they get something else. People watching the news hear about the monkey virus, they catch something else. And what they're doing is they're, they are spreading a mind virus. They're spreading, like, if you look at the idea of memes and memetics as analogous for genes and genetics and the idea that these ideas just transmit and they mutate and they spread like organisms, um, yeah, they are infecting or dumping into the collective psyche a lot of monkey god memes for some reason in a very immersive way. I mean, record-breaking numbers on this game where you're playing this monkey god. So again, they are definitely reaching everyone with this. And why? FMGR says, what's the most damning piece of evidence that the Trump shooting was staged? Um, well, it, it's because uh, the normies, you say the normies in your group, uh, they believe that the TV tells the truth. They think it's a window to the world and what you're seeing is organic and happening and the news media has a job of recording and then transmitting and broadcasting to you the information for your edification. Uh, they don't know that the screen is a filter. And so the burden of proof would be on them to be you know, completely honest about it. But I would say this, um, their belief is low information. They believe because they saw it on TV. Uh, our disbelief is grounded in information that goes beyond what they would have looked at just by being regular news consumers or quote normies. So normies are defined by low information belief. So the big picture of it is one, we predicted it and we're not psychic, we're not prophets, I don't have a crystal ball. So how can we predict such an event? Well it's because media isn't what normies think. It's a world view uh, forming apparatus, mass media, it, again, it's all there for worldview formation. But what's more, and I think this is what really kind of uh, puts it all in picture, in, into the big picture here, is that the major transformative events are all scripted in advance and there's plenty of foreshadowing for each one. So here's an example. A few days before the event, we were looking at the cover of The Atlantic or it was one of their articles, 
where you have the Supreme Court justices and their outlines against a red curtain. And we noted this looks like Trump is bleeding on the right side of his head. Looking closely, and you can see that the top of his ear is clipped. This is exactly where he was shot. Now, we have numerous examples of what we consider to be what we call predictive programming. Then we have concurrent programming, things that happen at the same time, like the movie release of... Let me, let me bring up the top 11, and let's just read through these. But if your understanding of the media is limited to it's just reporting news, it's not writing the news, it's not prefabricating it, you just won't get it. And that's fine. We're not trying to reach those people. We don't want to reach the people who have voluntarily submitted autonomy over their own minds to corporate and government-controlled media. So my top 11 examples of the Trump head wound scenario being predicted in advance, the Machete movie, where in the Machete movie, the Robert De Niro character, who is obviously playing Trump, gets shot at while he's talking about illegal immigration. And what was Trump talking about when he got shot? Oh yeah, the 20 million migrants. He called them a problem for the country. The movie Fallout, we talked about this one. You have one drop of blood on the right side of the figurine that looks just like Trump. A man in full, Charlie Coker, as Trump dies at the end of mechanization. Uh, uh, he was brought down by an Obama character. Leave the world behind. Let's move on. There's a couple other better ones, actually. Yeah, Captain America, Brave New World. The trailer. A president survives an assassination attempt. And this came out the day of. The Boys, Season 4, Episode 8, Assassination Run. The character Homelander is based on Trump. And not only that, but the title Assassination Run was changed after the fact because it was so closely reminiscent. Here you see the Trump guy with blood on his face. Just like you saw Trump with blood on his face. Another one, the photographer Doug Mills, who photographed George Bush having 9-11 whispered into his ear, also photographed the bullet going past Trump's ear. Now, this is obviously fake and staged, and there's no reason for a photographer to have a camera at that shutter speed to capture that unless he was trying to get a clear image of Trump's head exploding, which is what the conspiracy theorists think. But this is staging. This is theater. And there, there are many more examples of how it's theater. Thine ear shall bleed, released days prior. You have the red paint smeared on Donnie on his ear, and you have this poster. Then you have, let me bring this up. We were looking at the side of Trump's face. Um, let me bring this up first, Trump's social. So look at Trump's social avatar. So we had already been looking at the side of Trump's head as being the target, the right side of his head, where the 4547 is. Because 4547 gives you 911. And we have other reasons to predict the right side of the head. But this is his avatar. You'll see nine stars, and obviously, if you, you can see it, it's a 911 over his face. But it's the right side of his head that's emphasized. So we had said, okay, right side of his head, 911. This is all code. But then, if you look at the cover of Braveheart, the Braveheart film, you have Mel Gibson, who's a significant figure in Q lore, connected to Trump in a few ways. If you look at Jim Caviezel, Sound of Freedom. But notice how this is the Braveheart paint that he has on his avatar. Well, when, when Trump was shot, and he raises his fist, and he shouts, fight, 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 it looks exactly like that Braveheart shot. These are staged. This is a, a PR stunt. There are several other elements to this exact shot. It looks like that memorial war, that, that uh, Marine War Memorial. But again, the flag. Note the flag's position. You have the blue on the top left and the stripes down. Trump's face right here. This perfectly aligns with his avatar and with the Braveheart poster. But my point being, the biggest clue that this thing is fake is that every significant transformative historical event that occurs is a PR stunt. Prove me wrong. Bring up one transformative psyop, or event, we'll say, that wasn't a psychological operation or a PR stunt, that wasn't contrived. Feel free. And what we have found here is that your model of media 
and what it is is wrong if you don't include psyops, PR stunts, special effects, and the fact that there is no split in media left and right, but that it's controlled from the very top. Um, we could add on to this too that January 6th was a total hoax, Ashley Babbitt's not dead, and Trump was in on that as well. So the idea that he's a threat to the state, the deep state, and they're going to shoot him, no, he's part of their, he's one of their star characters. Uh, th there is no real fighting in this thing. It's all mind war. It's all fake. A lot of people don't want to hear that, though. Okay, let's see who else has joined us here. Skyfish. Oh, Estevan says, The audience reaction and the way his thumb was pinned to his forefinger. Oh, here's another example. After the event, after the event, you go to the RNC, and he shows up, and it looks like Elvis comeback special, and Hulk Hogan speaks. And Hulk Hogan says, Enough is enough. And enough is enough when they try to shoot the president. Well, enough is enough is the statement on the Illuminati playing card that looks just like Trump with a bullet whizzing by his head. Now, what's interesting about Hulk Hogan saying this is that it's in the context of him describing, and he says, I just had this recollection, but no, he had obviously planned on saying this. But he described how he remembers during Hulkamania looking up or rather, um, he's describing how the last time he saw Trump, it was at Hulkamania, where he's looking down at Trump, and he's got blood running down his face. And he's comparing this to Trump. And he says from then on, from there, he went to Hulkamania, and he won. So you have this little anecdote where Hulk is looking down, his face is bloody, and Trump looks up at him from the audience and blows him a kiss. And I'm thinking, wait a minute here. He's comparing these events, and it is well known that wrestlers do something called blading, where they cut themselves. They're using or fake blood, whatever they're doing, it's not real blood. And he was making a comparison that only two WWE Hall of Famers would get, that Trump did the same thing I did, fake blood on his head, looking down at us, chanting, fight, 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 on his way to victory. So I thought that was kind of a reveal. But the very scripted of the scripted nature of news has been established. Uh, you know, we're not conspiracy theorists here. Uh, those of you who believe the mainstream news are simply uh, conditioned to be duped. And I'm not even slightly interested in waking up Normieville. A lot of them will, out of insecurity, they will reflexively mock what we're saying and say that can't be true. And I'm like, sure, you know, stay in your paddock, stay in your cave, stay in your your box. Because we don't need that. We don't need people with zero discernment to flood our raft. There are enough of us who have already seen through it. So don't give them any hints. Don't try to pull them along. We don't need it. Uh, you have to deprogram at the level of the individual. And there are enough people who have already done so that we're better off aggregating them first. Joined by X322. Thanks for joining. The Incomplete says, De Niro fiddles while Rome burns, deer hunter Buck Moon. Yeah, De Niro is a highly significant character. All of his roles have some significance to this head wound thing. Conspire Act says, The black phone screens of the MAGA supporters all facing the camera as they appear to be taking photos and videos seems pretty blatant. Yeah, I would say so. David Hazel says, would you do text alerts again? Uh, I would do text alerts again. It, as soon as I can, if I could afford it, absolutely. I could definitely make that happen. Okay, let's see here. Rilo05 says, glad you're back on. The other stream was short. Yeah, Fakeologist and I just took about an hour. Now, more examples or more reasons why we would say that the shooting was fake beyond the fact that we predicted it. And yeah, a lot of people are saying Trump's going to get it. They're all going to. A lot of people are saying Trump's going to get shot. There's a chorus, but they said he's going to get shot for real. We said no, they're going to do a fake event, and we had predictive programming that showed with specificity it'd be the right side of his head. With specificity, it would be the top of his ear. It doesn't get clearer than that. So either you have to say 
hey, you at Infinite Plane Radio are a bunch of psychic prophets. Or you'd have to say you have a point that predictive programming is a model for understanding what's to come. They're saturating the collective psyche, giving us previews of what's to come. Estefan says, the chat is restricted, so don't tell them you're, they bleeped out Jewish. Um, well, you know, the thing is, we don't, I, I don't really have a lot of time for brainwashed people. And the people who think that, like, Jews did 9-11 are the dumbest people on the internet. Because 9-11 didn't happen. 9-11 was a PSYOP. And who's behind the PSYOP? Well, it gets a little more complicated than saying just this group. It's one of the most rank, stale, rotten red herrings out there. And I'm surprised a lot of people still fall for it. Mostly incels with grievances. I call them CJTs. The CJTs are the only people more annoying than the CRTs. Jamitra 101 says, Trump was on the New York Times Magazine in the 90s saying, fighting back across it. Trump is an entirely scripted character. The earliest example of Trump in predictive programming is a 1958 show called Trackdown, episode End of the World. Even CNN had to comment on how Trackdown was, a, was eerily predictive of Donald Trump. I mean, even they had to admit this. They're like, oh, this is really strange. His name is Trump. And here's the thing, too. This was noted back in 2016. So, um, Trackdown aired between 1957 and 1959. Western show predicts border wall. But, here we go. Vanity Fair. The television show that predicted Donald Trump in 1958. A con man named Trump scares the town into letting them build a wall. 1950 show shows a charlatan named Trump who wants to build a wall. But here's the thing. We noticed this in 2016. This was already talked about. However, in the episode, Trackdown, the Trump character gets arrested. So, we hadn't even, we hadn't even really at that time understood how significant that was. Like we could have said, hey, Trump's going to be arrested. In 2016, we could have looked at that 1958 movie, that TV show, and said, based on this 1958 video, Trump is going to build the wall, He's going to make people mad, and he's going to be arrested. And we would have been correct, based on predictive programming. Similarly, you can find movies that have predictions. Like, for example, The Shining. The Shining doesn't only reveal Kubrick's role in Apollo 11, but it has predictions for 9-11. So we know these events are all contrived, including the Trump shooting, which is predicted in Kubrick's work as well. But going forward, here we are in 2024, and we're able to look back at The Shining and say, hey, look, it also predicted 2020. It also has, again, elements related to everything up to now. So there's programming in these movies that hasn't even manifested yet in the news yet. Okay, let's see here. Dave Hazel says, remember the crying Nazi guy was all about the Jays? Yeah, anybody who's mad about that, they're just, it, it's ridiculous. They're just saying, oh, I'm so oppressed by this group over there. It's like, no, you're not. Dinah Southheart says, the scripts soften up people's minds. It does in the form of post-hypnotic suggestions and entering things into the realm of possibility that don't belong there. And the more they flood the zone with stuff that doesn't belong, or that would be considered extraordinary, the less extraordinary it appears when it happens on the news. So, for example, the predictive programming for alien invasions has created a population where a large segment of them are ready to believe. All they need is a light in the sky and an authoritative source to come out and say something. Till says Trump was in the programming since 1889 with the Baron Trump novels. Oh yeah, it even has a, a Pence, a Baron Trump, a specific reference to, I believe it's on the first page, a disputed election and riots on a November the 3rd, a Tuesday, 
I mean, that's straight out of 2020. So when you understand what media is and you have a full spectrum analysis of it that includes the existence of psyops and hoaxes and predictive programming and concurrent programming, when you understand what it is, you don't need to look at something like the Trump shooting and say, how do I know it's fake? No, you, you know it's fake because you don't have enough information to believe it to be to know it's true. Like it, that's really what it comes down to is evidence. What's your evidence that it was real? The argument from the screen is not enough evidence. So you, you don't actually have enough evidence to believe most of what they show you. You can choose to believe it, but if you choose to believe a lot of stuff, your cognition is at the mercy of whoever's telling you to believe these things. And what we have established and observed is that the worldview the consensus shares doesn't perfectly align with the real world. This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody here, but they don't overlap perfectly. And we're the ones pointing out where they don't overlap or where they're adding stuff in that have no real world counterparts, hyperstitions like mass shooters, suicide bombers, mushroom clouds, you know, nukes, uh, weapons, certain m weapons of mass destruction. There are so many things that do not exist except in the minds of the believers. And when you've taken the skeptical view, you can disabuse yourselves of believing in a bunch of nonsense, stuff that doesn't exist. So now here we are fomenting a culture of non-belief, non-believers. But not only are we non-believers, because we're not reality denialists. We're not reality compromised. But rather, we are informed non-believers. We know why we don't believe this or that lie. Whereas you believe it, because you didn't have a high standard of evidence. The mainstream media, the mainstream mediated worldview, turns you into a liar to the extent that you conform with it. So we have the moral high ground because we're not liars, you are. And if you're defending the media against our accusations, you're a media advocate. And you are on the wrong side of the screen. You're accepting the moral high ground, the intellectual high ground. And you're admitting you have zero discernment and you don't know real from fake. You're admitting that you're confused. I'm not confused. And I'm happy for people to want to debate these things uh, because we have the truth on our side and they have false confidence. They have trust placed in liars. And you know, it's, it's um, the individual's responsibility to pull themselves out of it. Although I question the motives of anyone who feels like they have to defend the honor of CNN. Like, oh, you're saying CNN's lying about this? Uh, yeah, well, it's all the media, yes. Okay, going through your comments. Yeah, fake until proven real, which isn't a high standard. You know, people will say, you can't say everything's fake. Yes, I can, until proven real. And if you can't prove it's real, I don't have to believe it. And if your job as the media is to present the news, then why is that a problem? You see, there shouldn't even be a problem. But some will straw man what we're saying, and they'll be like, you guys call everything fake. No. The mainstream calls everything real. That's the real problem. Low information believers. Diana Southheart says, I only know what I've seen firsthand. I believe my own, my own eyes. Vision is a part of our central nervous system in our brain. Sure, and I'm not making the argument for solipsism, that if I haven't seen it, it doesn't exist. No, it just means we have standards of evidence and we acknowledge objective reality. And there's a point I've been bringing up lately, that simulation theory is wrong-headed like you know you might make the argument that our existence is just a dream or whatever it's like fine be a mystic that's cool but that has nothing to do with media analysis simulation theory has nothing to do with describing the news or describing our world view and when people realize or they start to break apart the fact that the world view is a simulation um, they begin to get too close to the truth and what happens then they're hit with all kinds of theories like oh it's because it's a simulation it's a Mandela effect um, the reason why the news is fake is because everything's fake and simulation theory fits right in right there 
they shoehorn it in. I, I recently saw Joe Rogan describing how unbelievable it was that Trump turned his head at just the right time that the bullet missed him and cut his ear. He said, we must live in a simulation. And his guest agreed with him. Yeah, this is too mind-blowing. It must be a sim. No, the news is the simulation. The simulated events on the TV screen do not mean that reality is a simulation. But if you've been trained to take everything through the screen as objectively real, and then you're shown something hoaxy, you might be inclined to say reality is a hoax. That's where they want you. They don't want you to discern between the two. They don't want you to know that our consensus worldview is merely a model. Because if you figure that out, then you might notice that the model is not the territory. The map is not the territory. And here's a very significant quote here from Dune Messiah. And this is Frank Herbert. Quote, and this is referring to your friends. All your blue pill friends, all your normie friends who believe the news, who overreact to whatever's on the screen, who comply because they don't know any better, quote, they are not mad. They are trained to believe, not to know. Belief can be manipulated, but only knowledge is dangerous. So for example, they've been made to believe in space junk. That space junk at any moment could come down, punch a hole in your house, and possibly crush you so you should wear a helmet to bed. Believers believe in space junk. Believers believe that the world's going to end soon because of climate change. So if you are a believer, you can't opt out of these things. Do you believe in nukes? If you do, don't be ashamed. Just say it and chat. Yeah, I believe in nukes. Okay, you believe in this, then um, at any moment, the media can put a mushroom cloud on the screen and say, hey, they just got nuked uh, two states away from you. What are you going to do? If you're a believer, you're going to get on all fours and you're going to genuflect before the TV. You're going to bow. You're going to bow before the war god construct of the mushroom cloud. You're going to duck and cover and you're going to cower in fear and you're likely going to wet yourself. I'm sorry, but that's what happens. You're going to be so scared, you're going to lose control of all your faculties. You're just going to go into this fight or flight or freeze posture and you're not going to be able to do anything constructive until the authorities tell you what to do. That's where you're at. You're at their mercy. You can be manipulated. But I don't believe in nukes, so they can't do that to me. They can nuke Seattle and I will go outside with my press pass and I will document what I'm seeing. Because I prefer to know what's knowable and disregard what isn't. So I don't believe these things. And as long as you believe in their lies, you can be manipulated. You can be made to lock down because of alien invasions or anything. But fake news doesn't equal fake reality. Diana says they use the Bible as a script and many dupes fall for it. They use many myths. Like, for example, right now, there are two NASA astronauts stranded. And they took a capsule called Calypso on their space odyssey. And the book, The Odyssey, begins where Odysseus is stranded out there on an island because the nymph Calypso won't let him go. So Calypso, Stranded, Odyssey, Space Odyssey, they draw from many different sources. I call it syncretic storytelling. Some comes from Greek myth. The, the story of Persephone and her abduction during the fall is a reoccurring story. And this theme is replayed in so many movies and films. Alice in Wonderland, Westworld is an Alice in Wonderland, but it's ultimately Persephone. So they borrow freely New Testament, Old Testament, Masonic lore, and all the different myths. Dwayne Abith says, reality is manipulated through the simulation. That does not imply they are one and the same. Exactly. And this has been a develop. We've been developing this over some time because I, I remember conversations where people say, and we'd, we'd speculate, well, maybe they are tapping into the collective psyche to manipulate reality through us through some kind of magical means. Or that, and, and some will say, yeah, belief creates reality. And we're manifesting the reality that we believe in. And that sounds nice, but it's not true. Because 
billions of people believe in moon landings. And the last time I checked, those was those were still fake. So it doesn't matter if we all believe in it. It doesn't make it real. So what's the point then? Well, the point is that the mind will expand to the size of the box that it's put within. And it won't go any further. And we're the ones that cutting fringe, insisting there's more to it. There's life outside the box. It's like that movie Room I referenced, where the child grows up in a shed in captivity and doesn't believe there's a world outside. And when his mom tries to set him free, he doesn't believe her. He calls her a liar for suggesting there's more out there. He cries about it. I'm like, well, that's how people actually act. I'm like, what do you mean there's more to the story? Wah. Like, you're going to cry because you've been a dupe your whole life. You should just accept it. Just roll with it and move on. And in the movie, Room, he has to go through this paradigm shift where he, and it's kind of symbolic. You know, he's rolled up in a blanket. He plays dead. He's taken out with the trash and then he escapes. It's like a rebirth from a cocoon or something. But the idea here, of course, is they constrain our worldview to constrain our actions. But just because our worldview is altered doesn't mean reality is altered. The map is not the territory. And the map we've been given is a science fiction model of reality. Nasatology. It's real to some extent, but then it's augmented and at the edges where we can't test it, they make up whatever they want. Just like 1984. It's completely subjective. And another point too. There's a qualitative difference between a believer and a knower. Between a follower and a seeker. If you're a follower, you outsource your perceptions. You outsource your beliefs. So I'm a follower of this person or this cult, and I'm going to believe what they tell me. So you're a CNN believer. Good for you. You live in their box. You don't think for yourself. You have a consensus opinion based on what blue checks say, based on the top-down dissemination of memes. But if you're a seeker, you're not satisfied with what someone tells you. You have to know for yourself. So the seeker becomes a knower. And as such, they disabuse themselves of believing in things that are based on lies. So we believe less. We have fewer false explanations. And the trouble with false explanations, they kill curiosity. Oh, there's nothing else to see. You can trust us. We would never lie. Well, if you trust the perimeters they've given you, and you, you trust all the parameters, you trust the liars, and you never question it, well, then you become like Truman in the Truman Show. And Christoph, who was in the moon, his programmer said, regarding Truman, that we accept... I believe the way he said it was... I think we accept the world we have been... Let's see if I can get the direct quote here. Here we go. We accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. It's as simple as that. Who's, yeah, Christoph. We accept the reality of the world we're presented with. It's as simple as that. Now, uh, Christoph, by the way, is played by Ed Harris. And so he is Truman's creator. He is Truman's controller. Truman has to overcome Christoph to escape his little prison world. Interestingly, Ed Harris plays in Westworld The Man in Black. The Man in Black has to be overcome by Dolores to escape her little sim. So he's like Hades. He's kidnapped Persephone. And she has to overcome him. And then he's in the movie Snowpiercer where it's this closed system, this train, and he's the engineer at the very top of this pyramid. He's like the main controller of it all. So Ed Harris in various roles he plays this demiurge. He plays the one who keeps the person controlled in a false paradigm who has to be overcome. He plays Cain in Top Gun, which I think also has some significance. But you'll find that many of these actors play these archetypal roles again and again. Jessica Lynn says, When did you stop becoming a Freemason? Why is there an Iron Horus on your black and white penguin logo? Uh, which which um, penguin logo? 
Um, after the military, I joined the uh, Freemasons. And it was actually shortly after, well, it was, it was actually before, I, I was involved in Thelema. There's this group called the Abbey of Thelema. And I got into that group even though they weren't recruiting. And it's kind of a side story. Um, if you want to know, I may talk about it at some point. So I was already, like, I, w I was never a scared church lady. Um, I was never scared of any of the stuff. Like, so many people are just terrified. The truthers are characteristically scared and ignorant, and they don't know why they're afraid of what they fear. And I was always into investigating things. So I had investigated, for example, the Church of Scientology. And by investigating, I mean read their books, join them, meet them, learn as much as you can. So I was checking out Scientology, I was checking out the Mormons, I was doing deep dives into various Christian cults and other cults, Jehovah's Witness, and then at some point I got involved with the Abbey of Thelema, which was a Golden Dawn offshoot. And then after that, I had some, I learned about Freemasons when I was in the army, because there were so many of them. And I kept asking questions, I kept digging. And when I left, I managed to get the command sergeant major and, and someone else to sign off uh, to get me in because you have to have two people vouch for you and there weren't any in my family so I, I managed to get a couple of individuals to sign me in and I joined that and I was really struck by how similar the initiation structures are different rituals different nomenclature but it has the same dynamics that they establish and I came to this conclusion that all the various religions and cults are all part of one hydra with many different heads and that these are meant to be mutually exclusive categories so you never connect the dots fully but i was in the uh, freemasonic group for a few years i joined the scottish rite lodge and i broke away from it for a few reasons i was invited to join the shriners and one of the potentates actually signed me in and I didn't go. I didn't go to the hot sands or whatever they called it, their initiation. And it's because I, I was never really a, a group joiner. I was just investigating. I just wanted to know and see for myself. And But while I was in the Masonic group, I made some interesting connections. I met this um, older gentleman, and there was a huge generation gap. I mean, I was like 21, and everyone else there was like retired, 60s, 70s, 80s. And I met one individual who told me, because he saw how much time I spent in the libraries. He said, you're going to find more information here. And he introduced me to this other group that he got involved with called the Rosicrucians. And um, he gave me a box of books from their publications. And I was pretty astounded because I'm going through these Rosicrucian books. And I'm looking like, this is exactly the stuff that was being published by the OTO that when you go deep into the Masonic lore, yeah, it looks like it's all Judeo-Christian, but no, you go deeper, and I found this article, it was about the hermetic magical significance of the Blue Lodge rituals. So even though the Masons say it's not a religion and we're just hanging out, well, maybe they don't know, but their lodge rituals are essentially, quote, magic. They're doing, quote, magic, magical ritual, like witchcraft, whatever you want to call it, but you wouldn't know it unless you dug deeper. But what I had found, though, was that most of what Aleister Crowley published, most of what you see in the OTO literature is plagiarized, and it came from the Rosicrucians. And Rose Cross, um, it's the same thing with Scientology, it's a symbol, it's a cross with the X on it. This is all symbolic of the god and goddess, which is prevalent in all these different cults in different facets. But there was um, some, a few reasons why I left. It, it wasn't simply, I didn't have time for it, but it, it is very culty. I left the Thelemic group because it was culty. And by culty, I mean, I had to work. I was working at a gas station. I just left the military, and I was just trying to make money. And I was supposed to also be at a meeting. And my, quote, link, the person who was my handler or something, uh, was kind of harassing me. Like, you know, you should be... You should be over here. And I said, well, I have to make money. And they said, well, that's just your ego trying to stop you. Your ego is blocking you. Like they were pretty much putting pressure on me to quit my job and drive on up to their stronghold there in the mountains and uh, get all culty with them. 
And I was just like, no, I, I can't. I can't do this. I'm not going to be pressured by a group into quitting my job to attend a meeting. That's classic. Uh, you know, if, and I studied a bunch of cults. And dangerous cults, destructive cults will separate you from your friends, your family, and your obligations and make you dependent upon them. So I think I dodged a bullet there. But I learned quite a bit. And what I learned is that they are doing, or their structure, the OTO, it's the Order Templar Orientis, it's really no different than what the Mason Masonic groups do, except the Masonic group is couched in Judeo-Christianity, whereas the Thelemic group is based on Egypt, and they call themselves an Egyptian mystery school. But when you look at the Masonic thing, at some point it does in fact become pretty much Egyptian. It's all the same thing. But I, I left the Masons knowing that these individuals are, for the most part, ignorant. And a lot of them were just not interested in the deeper meaning of it all. But I did meet some interesting people, like I said. So when I was at the Scottish Rite Temple, I met an individual who um, told me that he was involved in this OTO group called Soul of the Desert. And he performed rituals for them. And then he was emceeing rituals here. And I'm just like, there's this overlap at the very top that I was picking up on between a number of key individuals involved in the occult groups, New Age circles, and the Masonic groups. And I did have one, one per, and I think there were some clues that I was being gang stalked. Like there's some stalking going on that I can attest to. And uh, I was told by one person that you're not going to hear or find anything here in in the regular rituals, but it's going to be in what he called the green language. And I didn't know what green language was. I'd never heard that expression, quote, green language. But I kind of got the idea that more was being said um, between the lines in a lot of the mundane conversations. And I think I, I managed to find something about that later. Here it is. Reading the green language of light. Green language of the Freemasons. All the initiates express themselves in Kent. It is clear that the Masonic green language is present in French and is more of a system of codes than a specific language. So I was told about this by someone. And like I said, there were some hints and clues dropped that made me somewhat uneasy at the time. Like, for example... Like I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there was some game playing going on, but for example, uh, there was a specific ritual, a, a degree where you're shown, you're given this title, um, and it has this double-headed eagle. One head is black, one head is white. And when I go out to my car to drive back home, I was done for the weekend. I'd gone through all the degrees. You do it all in one weekend. You, you do your one, two, and three over the course of several months. You have to memorize everything. Nothing's written down. You have to meet people. Like I had to meet someone in a bar and he'd read me a few lines of the oath. I'd memorize it, repeat it back. And when you have the whole thing, then you show up to the lodge and you play your part. So it's theater. It's all acting. And you play your part of the murdered and resurrected Hiram Abiff. But after you get through the first three, the Scottish Rite, which is 4 to 32, is all done in one weekend. So I go for that, and when I leave, I see this bottle cap next to my car, and it was a Smirnoff, you know, the, the um, vodka. And I was inside the whole weekend, and I had not been near my car, so I'm looking at this double-headed eagle um, bottle cap next to my vehicle, and I had just basically um, been educated about the meaning of the double-headed eagle. So I didn't think this was a coincidence that it was placed right there. So I start driving home and my odometer wasn't working. Like it had been snipped or something and my mileage had been stuck on 33. So I, I was like thinking as I'm driving home that they had uh, screwed with my car. And this wasn't the first time I had something like that happen. In fact, it was like the second time. But 
I have many other instances that I noted where I think gang stalking is a big part of these groups. Uh, it was even more pronounced with the Scientologists, and I have witnesses to this. And same thing with the the Thelemic group. I never have ex I don't have examples of gang stalking, but they did have this way of bringing people in. So, for example, they have you meet them at a public place. You meet one person, they interview you, you have a second interview, and then you're invited. And by invited, I mean meet us at this post office here at the edge of town. And then you get picked up by a van, no windows, and you don't know where you're going. You go to this garage, you go upstairs, and you know the hood over your head. So you're purposefully disoriented. Like I remember specifically for like an hour um, repeating a mantra while sewing your robes together and stuff, going downstairs with a bag over your, a, a, wood, a wool sack over your head and a rope around your neck, like walking downstairs blindfolded is kind of unnerving. And I think the idea here is like you don't know if you're going to step off a cliff, like you're the fool in the fool's card where he steps off the cliff and it's about plunging into the unknown. So it's sort of a test of faith when you take a step um, into the dark blindfolded down the stairs it's meant to disorient you but I later learned that when I was being interviewed in public there were other people there who were part of the cult who were just blending in and spying and listening in but I didn't know any of them until after the fact so they're already stalking you and showing you how in public you could be surrounded by the cult and not know it and I think that's part of this implicit threat about not telling the secrets because, you know, the blood oath, the idea of that it's all about secrecy and you don't know who is in the club around you at any given moment. And I think it's to create, like, I think a lot of the gang stalking was meant to convey something about how pervasive this is and that at any time, any place, uh, you're under the all-seeing eye's gaze. Going through comments, Elephant Tusk says, they figure out you were just there to investigate them. Probably. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, they did go, like, the, the Masons go to your house before you get in, and they interview your friends. They don't tell you who they're going to interview. You have to give them some character references. They do background checks. But when they came to my place, they took a special interest in my bookshelf and asked me about these various books I was reading and what my interests were. And the main thing they want to know is, um, do you believe in a higher power? That's like one of the main requirements. Do you believe in a higher power? Esteban says the CW lead beater books. I had some books by Israel Regarde, who was Crowley's um, secretary. They were interested in that. I was more or less disappointed by the fact that nobody there seemed all that interested in anything other than the meetings. Just chit chat. It wasn't what I thought, but the library told a different story. I mean, the, the books that I found there um, suggested that there's a, an entire body of knowledge, I think, that is kind of like more or less gate kept. And it has to do with religion, as I think religion, all religions, are part of the same group. But it's a very ignorant group, I'll say. Layers and layers of ignorance. And what's with the secrecy? You know, like, wh why the secrecy? I mean, there really aren't any secrets in the sense that everything's been published, but it's about the, I think it's about the structure, the pyramidal structure, and the purposeful division between those who have been shown the light and those who are on the outside. And that's a common facet of all these different cults. It's the compartmentalization. And a lot of it is intel gathering, uh, learning about the members. And and I think it's uh, interesting, too, and I found this to be annoying. The Thelemic group insisted I keep journals that they could read, dream journals that they could read, and then anything else, like books that they told me to read. But it, it just seemed to be a little too controlling. And I didn't know if I wanted a lot of people I don't know, um, reading my thoughts, reading what's um, on my mind, reading my dreams, it just seemed extremely 
invasive. And the group that I refer to, they weren't openly advertising. It was just surely by coincidence I managed to get my way in. But they had a Stonehenge-like setup and a biosphere. And I said, what's that for? You know, the, the little biodome. And they said, when you're ready to get in contact with your holy guardian angel, you can spend, I think it's like six months. You spend six months in this dome doing meditations day and night. And at the end of it, supposedly, during this time, you're supposed to establish contact with your higher self. Sensory deprivation. Diana Southheart says, I barely remember my dreams. Well, looking back on it, I, I can understand the usefulness to a lot of it. They were heavily focused on yoga. And I didn't have a lot of patience for it. And then they were coming up upon some kind of spring overnight event. And I didn't want to be involved in that because I heard rumors about what happens. And I wasn't at the time, even now, I was just like, I don't know about camping out in the middle of nowhere with um, a bunch of strangers in what is primarily at some point a sex cult because that's what it becomes at some point if you've read the OTO um, their rights and their degrees it's progressively bringing people into a smaller group and I wasn't convinced it was for enlightenment but rather it might be for something else it might be just a deeper level of control like deeper and deeper levels of control over the members like I said, I, I got the feeling it was a destructive cult. Which is very much typical. Um, controlling relationships. I would argue that the mainstream consensus worldview is a destructive cult to the extent that you believe in you believe in it. Most people don't take it seriously enough to get all culty about it. But you look at the fringe, look at the activists, uh, look at the Acts, the acts inspired by believing in stuff literally. And yeah, you can see why it's culty. We are in a doomsday cult by every definition. Okay, let's continue here. We're talking about a few things. We're talking about the monkey god and why that's being promulgated right now. My theory is the monkey god and is somehow tied to the rage virus concept. Chimp Crazy is out right now, if anybody wants to watch it. Chimp Crazy, another thing to add to what we have already been discussing about people keeping chimps as pets. All right, phones are open, 505-510-4226, if anyone has anything to add. Now, one other thing, too, um, so many truthers are going to talk about the Masons rule the world, but how many of them, do you know, have spent the time investigating to get any inside information? Very, very few. And some people have held this against me. They say, oh, you, you are one of them. It's like, what do you mean? Like, I am cutting fringe. No one has gone deeper into the cult's inner sanctum than, than we have. Uh, collectively, and I think this is a valuable experience. I was at a Scientology org, and Dave Miscaviage was there, inspecting the sauna. At the time, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know the significance of him. I didn't. I was new to the group, but everyone there was like fawning over him, and I was like, "Who is this?" I didn't know who he was, but he was right there next to me, and he didn't acknowledge me, but I knew he was a big deal because what they were saying. And he was involved. He was involved then in something called Criminon, where they were getting Scientology into the various jails and recruiting from the prisons, which I think is interesting because they believe Criminon that they can get rid of crime. Like it's very idealistic, but, but they were obsessed with treadmills, niacin, and saunas, just endlessly sweating, believing that it's purification. Um, and one of the points, too, Scientology is another facet of the OTO. It's another Egyptian mystery school disguised as an alien cult. You could say the same for, for Nasatology. 
Uh, Nasatology pretends to be a space age sci fi religion, but it's an Egyptian mystery school at the top. Deep program truth that says too much monkey stuff all at once to be predictive programming for a future event. Yeah, it's so much right now with the 90 foot statue, the WHO, and all the movies and the video game plugging a million people into this archetype that there's no coincidence here. They have brought the monkey god onto the world stage for a reason. The common theme is rage virus. That is the common theme. Elephant Tusk says the syndicates always recruit from the prisons. Yeah, well, Dianetics and Scientology are very popular there. And having investigated Scientology, um, I emerged from it with an understanding that this is a, a pandemic model as a religion. But you replace virus with mind virus, which they call engrams. And it's the exact same thing. And interestingly, virus, in my opinion, is a new iteration of the old concept of sin. And imagine if you believe in sin literally, so you quarantine against the sinners, those who won't be saved. And only when they're saved can you let them in. And if you believe in this and you quarantine for sin, and you can understand you want to get everybody saved so there's no sin in the world, while well, Scientology wants to, quote, clear the world, get rid of all the engrams, which are mind viruses. So the idea of a mind virus as a thought crime is actually based on sin, just like the engram based on sin. These are just new iterations of an old concept of holy war and the purification of the minds of the believers. Elephant Tusk says, the operatives are always let out of prison and put into criminal organizations as henchmen. Yeah, I can name, and I've, I've met a few individuals who were employed by the FBI to promote conspiracy theories on YouTube. And these are individuals who were scraped from jail cells, the bottom, the very bottom. We're talking uh, child predators. Let loose to spread flat earth. Biblical flat earth. That's insane. That's insane right there. That I, could, I can name three flat earth sex offenders that were given very prominent roles in spreading the meme through mainstream channels. And to me, that sounds like a hit job. Like, should this ever get out of control, this can be exposed. But actually, I can name four. Maybe the number's higher. But I'm talking about individuals I can name who are Offenders who got some kind of a deal and then who were given very prominent roles and you can see who handled them. So no, it's, it's not really that uncommon. In fact, the guy from Globebusters told me on a private phone call because he hated my guts and he was just telling me that he had government friends, he would sick on the IPS and he told me that he did intel for Denver police. And I'm like, what does that even mean? But then I look around him in his circle and he's surrounded by uh, felons, people who spent time in prison, who now suddenly found themselves promoting conspiracy memes on YouTube. And these channels are blown up, they're given a lot of support. And so that's what controlled opposition looks like. Elephant Tusk says the legal system works in their favor to keep enemies locked up and operatives released early and recruited into the syndicate organizations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of stuff very clear here. You know, you're looking at compromised individuals. Individuals who are faced with the choice, you know, exist in the jail prison ecosystem where you're the lowest of the low, or you can be famous on YouTube for spreading unpopular ideas. And we can back this up. I mean, we have records to prove it. And it was pretty shocking. We did a whole documentary on it called Behind the Perv. Because when we exposed a couple of these individuals, everyone ran, everyone got behind them. It's like they defended it. I'm like, wait, how can you be a Bible earther? And now you believe in Q and saving the children, but you're defending a predator in your midst. 
Dwayne Aubith says, people who can be bought and easily manipulated become the influencers. Yeah, precisely. Puppets. And we've witnessed it firsthand, and we have plenty of evidence. It's standard operating procedure. It's pretty shocking. I mean, it shouldn't be. Is Q a cult? Oh yeah, Q is 100% a cult. It's a religion. And there, there are elements to it, but it's definitely a doomsday cult. It fits all of... And it, I think one of the things that recruits people into it are the videos that show alleged victims of child abuse and child trafficking. They show these videos to shock people and say, look, the deep state's doing this, Hillary Clinton's doing this, and you can save the children. So they kind of shock people into how bad the world is, but now you're part of the solution, which is a typical cult recruitment tactic. You know, in Scientology, they teach you that the world is full of engrams, and that you cannot have peace of mind or mental health until you get rid of engrams, which means you have to get rid of your connections to the world. It becomes very isolating. It's all about isolation and quarantine. Again, the Scientology church is built on the pandemic model and ultimately quarantining and disconnecting from people who won't be saved. Elephant Tusk says, all those judges, lawyers, etc. are blackmailed and follow their orders and directives. This is deep. I agree. It has to be. I mean, every single PSYOP and this, to me, uh, this point I'm about to raise here debunks the synchromistic explanation because these aren't random events. We're talking actors, like crisis actors, but every one of these events also has, therefore, directors, writers. But more significantly, they involve law enforcement, fire departments, first responders, politicians, government. So every single psychological operation, every simulated event presented as news every mass casualty event presented as real is a joint operation that includes law enforcement government media politicians as well as actors there are so many people involved i mean take for example white noise palestine ohio train derailment toxic airborne event mushroom cloud happens after the movie white noise just like what happens in that movie well the event, the simulated train derailment, wasn't done by a handful of people. You know, these, these aren't hoaxes. We say, you know, they use the word hoaxes because it helps make it small. Like, oh, this little news organization, these reporters did this event, or they were fooled by the, these actors. No, it's, it's not a mere hoax. It's a mass casualty or a simulated event, but it's a production that necessarily requires the cooperation of government and law enforcement, EMTs, fire department, first responders. It requires the entire infrastructure to pull it off. They're making history like that. Ryler, Ryler 05 says, just like that, Three Mile Island movie came out a week before Long Syndrome about nuclear meltdown. Then Fremont happened. This is where it's at, it says blackmail. They've been groomed since childhood. They're playing their part on the world stage. Yeah, black, it may not be blackmail. It may be blood oaths. It may be security clearances. Jessica Glenn has said, it's hard to imagine they can keep tabs on so many people to make sure they don't talk. This is why I make the argument too, I make this point that largely, you know, you could say we're all in this big box, the programmed, and then you have the programmers. But the programmers are in, it's more of a Venn diagram. So it's not like a box on top of a box, but it's overlapping circles. And so the programmers overlap with the programmed 95% of the time. That they're just as deceived. And they're only deprogrammed about the specific facet that they're going to be involved in. So you would be, let's say you were a crisis actor involved in a mass shooting. You're not going to be told about fake space or fake shootings in general. You're just going to be told about this specific operation. 
they wouldn't tell everybody everything. It would never make sense. There's this argument you often hear, uh, no way they could have faked 9-11. Too many people would have known about it. No way they could fake a moon landing. There were 400,000 contractors. Uh, yeah, you're ignoring the fact of hierarchical organizations, compartmentalization, stratification, need-to-know basis compartments where uh, you would only need to know that which doesn't compromise the mission for you to know more and enough for you to do your part. So you may be part of the programming class as an entertainer and never know about PSYOPs. All you know is you're reading lines or you're in a movie and the movie you're in may contain predictive programming but you have nothing to do with it. The director would. And so we're, we're looking at how the system protects itself through control of information. The programmers are programmed. We are different. We, the deprogrammed, are not part of the deception and we're not part of the deceived. And as such, we're not compartmentalized. We're able to look at the full spectrum level of fakery. We're like, not just stuck with fake shootings. And some truthers are like that. Like they'll say, oh, well, they may fake stuff on the ground, but everything in space is real. Oh, space junk is real. Or these astronauts stranded in the Calypso is real. How do you know? There's a point where people have to recognize that the same infrastructure lies to you about what's above and what's below. These things are not separate. Dwayne Aubith says, as far as the news anchors are concerned, they're reporting real stories. Yeah, here's something else too. They are reading scripts. They may not be directly connected to the stories, but even if they are, even if you're a truthful, legitimate reporter, you're standing upon an edifice of lies because the organization you speak for believes in space junk, believes in atom bombs, believes in fill-in-the-blank fake news narrative of the day. So nothing you say has any truth to it. You have become a liar. The world stage makes you into a liar. Your mainstream mediated minds are liars by default, and they don't know. They're unwitting liars, but they're liars. If you're telling me that 40 kids had their heads chopped off or 40 babies were decapitated on 10-7, in my view, you are a liar because you have no evidence. You're lying on behalf of media. Whatever happened to, I don't know. I don't have enough information. This is where it's at, says blackmail. I used to think this was a possibility, but Epstein, Diddy, Hugh Hefner, all their issues connected to blackmail, it's bogus news and a smoke screen. Leo Pirate says, compartmentalization of secret societies is difficult for many to understand. The lower levels of these orgs are cannon fodder. The Masons are shocked when I say quotes from Pike they didn't know of. Well, the Albert Pike quote about Lucifer is fake, but it shouldn't be difficult for them to understand if they've been in the military and they know what security clearances are, or if they apply common sense to structures of corporations. Like, would the low-level workers, the entry-level workers, know what's going on on the top floor in the boardrooms? No. Or if you're a, let's say you're an extra on a movie. Would you have any inkling about what is happening in the scene at the very, I guess, at the resolution of the movie where the main character and the woman they fall in love, they have these words, like whatever happens at the end, the very intimate stuff, you wouldn't know about it. You're not the director. You're, you're not in that particular box at that time. You know, it's compartmentalized. So you wouldn't say everybody on the movie set knows everything about it. Heck no. It doesn't work that way. And something else too. And this has to do with frame of reference. Uh, people who watch the news who believe it or assume it to be true if they can't debunk it from where they're sitting are making the same error, the same logical error that you would make if you're at a magic show. And you assume that whatever you can't see through is magic. Well, I don't know how he pulled that rabbit out of the hat, therefore it's magic. That's not logical. You know it's a magic trick, right? Just because you can't figure it out from where you're sitting doesn't make it real. Well, just because you can't figure out how it's fake on the screen 
because you're sitting on your recliner doesn't make it real. The world stage psychological operations are in fact magic tricks. What happened to Trump, uh, Donald Trump's ear? That was a magic trick. And people will say, well, no, it looked real to me. Yeah, I can, I can actually take my thumb and I can take the top digit off my thumb off. I can actually pull off my thumb and put it back. But it only can fool you if you're seated over there and you don't see how I'm actually bending my right thumb and left thumb and making it look like it's the same thumb by covering up the joint with my index finger. And auto hoaxers, media skeptics, we don't sit in our seats and watch the magic show and believe it. We are walking around, going backstage, and reading their books. Okay, moving on. Leo Pirate says, Much how I don't like to believe the protocols of the learned elders is real, and it's a smear campaign, however, what is described is very real. Yeah, the protocols is another one of these obviously um, debunkable hoaxes, but the compartmentalization is a given, and it, it's one of the weakest arguments against conspiracy theories. Too many people would know. Give me a break. It's naive at this point. And we get these occasional stories like Jussie Smollett or Bubba Smollett where you have an obvious hoax and the media takes it down. And this is to make you, or Brian Williams, who had all kinds of lies that he told. And people will say, look, if there's a hoax, they're going to expose it. It's like, no, those are fake hoaxes exposed so you don't know that hoaxing is their standard operating procedure and it's the rule, not the exception. Fake fake is what we should call that. Rilo05 says people around Cleveland are reporting seeing a monkey. I almost want to go watch this bad monkey movie for any predictive programming. Yeah, here we go. Cleveland. Looks like there's a story right now in Cleveland. There's a monkey running around. Let me play this clip. News 19, developing story. Neighbors say there's a monkey on the loose. So this just is in line well, with everything else. Hail. See what I did there? Uh, of Unlimited. Days. People say it's fun. A All animal, but no one is sure. Day. Okay, we're getting flooded with commercials, but yeah, there's a monkey on the loose in Cleveland, and it's on the news. So here you have a local news reporter. Now this is not a coincidence. This is not the anything more than a PR stunt. So this guy probably believes it. He probably believes that there's a monkey running loose in Ohio and he's just reporting the facts. There's no way he would know that this is some kind of a PSYOP. And, and PSYOPs are not just violent events. There are so many more forms of psychological operations that they take. Yep, Cleveland, Ohio, there's a monkey loose. People report sightings in Chardon, Geneva. It's the talk of the town in two different cities. There's a mysterious animal. Social media is buzzing about the site. I never saw a picture of anything, just a lot of people swearing they saw a monkey and wonder and they're wondering if they're going crazy. Chardon police say they've received two calls about the monkey. They haven't found it yet. Either way, people are enjoying the conversation. If you saw a monkey, what would you do? I would say, Wow, they're not lying, says Melton. Okay, well, there you have it. There's a monkey on the loose, which is in line with everything else we've been talking about tonight regarding this monkey meme. So you can see how this works. It's a immersive echo chamber. Whether you're playing video games, watching movies, watching the news, or just in general, just living on Earth right now, there's a monkey in your face. If you're in Houston, there's a 90-foot tall monkey. If you're a video gamer, you probably participated in a game where you played the monkey god. So it's inescapable. Rilo05 says, Ohio is in the shape of a heart. Therefore, through Ohio, the psyops spread through the country because the heart pumps blood. Yeah, I 
brought that up with the Palestine, Ohio. Ohio is the heart of it all. And it was like a heart attack. The train derailed because under regulation, greed. It was representing America. Capitalism got us fat and it's having a heart attack. But also, the mushroom cloud in East Palestine, I think is a reference to the Middle East and Israel. We're talking about the heart of a nation. So Israel, Palestine, Ohio, America, you have these regions that represent the center of a nation or the heart of a nation, the heart of it all. And that's where the nuclear blast happened, or rather the mushroom cloud, which is foreshadowing for the blast. This is where it's asked as monkeys were associated with AIDS back in the day. Yeah, there you have that too. So we have the bat with COVID and the monkey with AIDS. Michelle Castor says murders at the Rue Morgue. Yeah, very... The Edgar Allan Poe thing, and of course the killer ape. I need to watch this Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I need to watch Bad Monkey. I think we're onto something here. Obviously we're onto something. They have force memed the monkey god into the collective psyche in a very immersive way for the video gamers. So what's going on here? What are they about to pull? All right, we covered all the monkey stuff for now. Jessica Glenn says Fauci's involved in both. Right, right, exactly. This is where it's at. It says Bad Monkey is a funny show. Well, Bad Monkey, Rage Monkey, we're looking at this theme here again of a, a pox, but the monkey thing is consistently tied to violence. The movie Monkey Man, Monkey Man trailer, just to play a few seconds of it, you're, you're looking at a movie about a boxer in a, in a monkey mask. Let's see if I can find a good description of it. Embodied by the legend of Hanuman, which is the 90-foot tall monkey statue, an icon embodying strength and courage, Monkey Man is about an anonymous young man who ekes out a living in a fight club where night after night he wears a gorilla mask and he's beaten bloody by more popular fighters for cash. But here's the part I'm noticing that I think is consistent. After years of suppressed rage, his trauma boils over and he seeks retribution. So we're talking about a essentially a monkey in captivity getting revenge. This is the story in 28 Days Later. This is the story in Project X, the idea of captive monkeys. And then this documentary that was brought up um, earlier tonight has to do with the people who keep monkeys as pets. And the theme here again is called Chimp Crazy. What is Chimp Crazy about? It tells the story of a lawsuit brought against a woman in Missouri who owned several chimpanzees and pets and considered herself their mother. So essentially, it, this is the idea that these animals are being oppressed or abused or in some way uh, mistreated and so the monkeys are about to get back. They're about to get their revenge. So that's the theme I'm seeing, the violence popping up. All right, well, this has been great. We're going to continue this conversation tomorrow, and I'll send out the archives in the last couple of days through the newsletter, and I'll send you a link to Fakeologist. I want to say thanks to all of you who were there at the Fakeologist event. Uh, thanks again for adding to this um, body of, of uh, predictive programming clues and hints. Something is happening. Again, something's happening. 8.14, Monkeypox declared. 8.14, Bad Monkey released. 3.11, Monkey Man movie released. So Monkey Man, 3.11, virus reference. Jordan Peele produced it. Nope has a killer chimp attached to it. Now what's more, Nope was based on the spectacle following or during the George Floyd event. So you have a theme here of an uprising following this retribution. We have the 90-foot statue. We have the video game with a million concurrent players. Return to Planet of the Apes, also referenced at Paris. 
Obama on the world stage with the monkey god in his pocket. And now we have 28 Days Later being remade as 28 Years Later. 28 Days Later contains the killer apes and the rage virus, directed by the guy who directed Civil War, which just came out all about right-wing terrorism, right-wing militias, right-wing hate. So the mind virus concept has been attached to Disease X or X, Twitter, and the memes that radicalize the far right. So my prediction here is that the monkey virus and this ape stuff and monkey man is all about rage bubbling up in the form of some kind of collective violence on the far right and it's going to be specifically blamed on the internet which will need to be regulated because the mind virus is turning people ragey and they've already played this card if you remember the shooting Robert Card just to kind of underscore this he was the one who shot at the bowling alley Robert Card US Army reservist and they say that he fell into what they call a Twitter bubble and I had never heard that expression before but they said that he went into a Twitter bubble, came out of it with an AR-15, and shot a bunch of people. So he caught a rage virus. The worst mass shooting in Maine history. He killed 18 people, injured 13 others. And again, this is a, an example of what they're calling, or what has been referred to as a Twitter bubble. So he caught the, the rage virus. He caught disease X. So again... I think this monkey virus is a disease X reference. All right, this has been great. Thank you all for the your time and your comments. We'll continue this soon. This is Chief Crow. The edge is in your mind. in your mind the edge is in